Our guest today is Berkeley professor and part-time research scientist director at Meta, Jitendra Malik. Jitendra has been at the forefront of computer vision research for multiple decades. He has mentored over 70 PhD students and postdocs. Many have gone on to the top industry research labs, as well as have become professors at MIT, Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, Caltech, Cornell, and so forth. Jitendra's works have been cited over 200,000 times, making him one of the most highly cited researchers across all engineering disciplines. Notably, he was awarded the Longe Higgins Prize in 2007 and 2008, and the Helmholtz Prize twice in 2015 for contributions that have stood the test of time, awarded to papers after 10 years of publication. Jitendra has been elected into the National Academy of Engineering, into the National Academy of Sciences, and into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. With my personal outsider in view on computer vision, I've always seen Jitendra as the flag bearer of the computer vision community, both through a wide range of algorithmic contributions, as well as through making computer vision into a more benchmark-driven discipline, which dramatically accelerated the entire field. Lately, Jitendra has turned his attention to the problem of achieving more human-like intelligence, a quest in which robotics research has become central, something I'm, of course, particularly excited about. Jitendra, so great to have you with us. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. I'm really looking forward to our chat, Jitendra. Uh, but before divide, diving into today's conversation, um, I'd like to thank our podcast sponsors, Index Ventures and Weights and Biases. Index Ventures is a venture capital firm that invests in exceptional entrepreneurs across all stages, from seed to IPO. With offices in San Francisco, New York, and London, the firm backs founders across a variety of verticals, including AI, SaaS, fintech, security, gaming, and consumer. On a personal note, Index is an investor in Covarian, and I couldn't recommend them any higher. Weights and Biases is an ML ops platform that helps you train better models faster with experiment tracking, model and dataset versioning, and model management. They are used by OpenAI, NVIDIA, and almost every lab releasing a large model. In fact, many, if not all of my students at Berkeley and colleagues at Covarian are big users of Weights and Biases. Chitendra, let's dive into our conversation here. ChatGPT and other large language models are all the rage right now. And of course, we have a lot to be proud of with Berkeley graduate John Shulman being at the center of these efforts at OpenAI. But despite all the excitement in your recent talks, you've made it very clear that today's AI is still very, very limited compared to human intelligence. Can you say a bit more about your thinking here? Certainly, Peter. Uh, to me, it's uh, this is uh, something which has been known, at least in a segment of the AI community for a while, as uh, Morovec's paradox. And uh, you can, we can tie it to the history of intelligence as a whole. So if we think of intelligence as the biological uh, construct, which emerged through evolution, so going back like 550 million years ago when we have the first animals that can move and then uh, they can see, and seeing is important to moving because that's how you get to know where to go to find food and so on. And then on to, uh, let's say, the last 7 million years when you have the evolution of hominids from other primates. And there is this uh, very nice evolutionary data on, from fossils, which is that the evolution of the brain followed the evolution of the hand as an opposable a uh, hand with a thumb, which is opposable. And it, this comes after we became bipedal. We could started to walk on two feet, so the hand was free to build tools and manipulate the object. And then the opposable thumb helped us. And uh, and then, uh, of course, tool making led to uh, humans getting an advantage uh, over other species, even though they are, as such, quite small and frail compared to many other animals. So, uh, and then, of course, we have the emergence of language. So, uh, my rough calculation is something like this. If you think of 
all of evolutionary history as uh, like 24 hours, then language is the last two or three minutes. And uh, language, symbolic thinking, and many of the, the, the things that we associate with uh, sophisticated uh, reasoning. So in a sense, uh, it's remarkable that uh, GPT-4 can do like at the 90% level in a law exam or in various tests or various sorts. I mean, this is incredible. And from the perspective of the general public, this is a sign of great intelligence. I would like to connect this back to, in fact, achievements of AI even 20 years ago when we had the first programs that could beat uh, humans at chess. Like I think that's in the late 90s. And then, of course, we had uh, the deep mind work where they showed that they could, their programs could beat humans at Go. And these are remarkable. And to the general public, performance at these games is the ultimate achievement in intelligence. And it is remarkable. I'm not trying to uh, downgrade that accomplishment. But to me, all the stuff which, uh, on, uh, which precedes that kind of level of accomplishment is equally important. And this includes basic sensory motor competence, the ability to see, the ability to move, the ability to manipulate objects, the ability to plan, and so on. So that's that's where I am. And and I feel that, uh, that uh, we will not have conquered intelligence until we have, uh, we have conquered all those aspects of uh, intelligence as well. I have a lot of follow-up questions here, Jatendra. <laughs> so first... You said um, something that really stood out to me. The development of the brain followed the development of the hand. Um, what does that mean when, when you talk about development of the brain? Did our skulls get bigger as a species? Did new regions emerge that have different capabilities? What exactly happened? So here, uh, I mean, the fossil data is about the size of the skull. And there's data on the hand. So what we have are uh, fossils which uh, which people have found which are correspond to the structure of the hand. So in the fossil uh, record, we can get an idea of that, and we can get a sense of the the volume of the of of the of the cavity of the of the head in which the brain is, and so we can use those to uh, to connect up. What the soft tissue inside the brain is never preserved in these fossils. So we are I mean, some of our able, we, we can't answer some very specific questions, but but there was this debate which actually goes back to Greek philosophy, which is uh, did uh, is the is because we are intelligent that we can uh, manipulate objects well, or is it because we manipulate objects well that we may became intelligent? And uh, I, there's a quote of that I like from a Greek philosopher called Anaxagoras which is that it is because of his hand that man is the most intelligent of other animals. And uh, I, I, so that could be like a debate, right? But from the fossil evidence, we actually know the sequencing which came first. And it appears to follow the, the order where the, the development of the hand led to the development of the brain in some ways. Because uh, you, 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 that bigger brain could exploit that. Now I'm, I'm thinking back, you know, back back in the early days, you think about human life, it wasn't nearly as complex in many ways as, as today's life is. There was much less to, to navigate. And as I understand what you're saying is that you'd like to first see if we can develop an intelligence that's capable of doing those things, that has the basic abilities of, let's say, chasing other animals or evading other animals or finding things in the wild, helping other humans do things, and that that is somehow, it's clearly missing today. What I'm curious about, do you think that um, doing that will also make language models better? Will the language models become more robust, less brittle, if there is a foundation of physical interaction abilities? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and to some extent, it's an experimental question which, over time, uh, our field will answer. But uh, let me tell you my bias on this. Uh, so, if we uh, take uh, a developmental life, so the life of a child, 
So the early stage of a child is very much the sensory motor stage. Uh, the child is playing around with objects, learning to crawl, then learning to walk. And of course, the child is being uh, also provided uh, linguistic input from the parents and or other caregivers. But that linguistic input is very grounded, right? The mother may say, give me the ball. And there is a very clear object in front, which the child knows is the ball. And then the word give has a very clear uh, meaning, uh, referent in terms of an action and so forth, right? So the early words that a child acquires are very grounded in sensory motor experience. They evoke, the word ball evokes a visual impression. It also evokes a motor impression. I, I see a ball and I feel like throwing it. I mean, this is what Gibson called affordances. A chair, a chair has a visual imagery and a chair is, it sort of tells me how to sit down. So there's a motor action. Now, the early words in a child's vocabulary are of this nature, and then the child acquires these words, and it, they, the child acquires verb, uh, you know, subject, verb, object, triplets, and so forth. And this is the beginning of language, and then it gets more elaborate. Now, later on, the child goes to school and starts reading books. And then in the books, there are all these beautiful sentences and text and there are words like justice and peace and fairness. And many of those words, in fact, acquire their meaning in context. And I don't necessarily have a very mental, immediate, visual picture of what fairness is. But I do have that concept and it is related to other concepts. Now, the kind of learning we are doing at that stage, we don't go around looking up the meanings of individual words and dictionaries. We read and we acquire meaning by context. And this is a pretty close to what's happening inside uh, these language models like GPT-3 and GPT-4. Okay, there's a word which is deleted. You try to predict that from the context. So I think it that process is fairly close to the process of how we acquire knowledge when we read books as humans, uh, you know, throughout our schooling and, and throughout life, if you will. But there was that earlier stage, right, which was very directly grounded. Now, for a grown adult, maybe 80% of their vocabulary was acquired through these words whose meaning was captured in context. But I'm arguing that that 20% came first and is, is also very important. And what we are, what we need to do for, I think, the full development of intelligence is to sort of capture that. And language models which are not grounded will miss out on this, uh, this aspect. Now, I don't view this as a fundamental failing because uh, clearly... Uh, I mean, there are now uh, models that people are developing, which are vision and language. You have these multimodal models and so forth. I mean, these are coming out from places like uh, Google and uh, Meta and so on. And I think that's in the right direction. But in my mind, all of these need to be there. Now, just just research brainstorming almost. Uh, they could come in either order, maybe. In humans... The grounding comes first. A basic ground vocabulary comes first. Um, what we see in some of the research that's happening is people just take the large language models and hope to later attach to it grounding, um, which for humans would probably not be practical. Not clear how humans would learn in that order. But it, it is possible, maybe. I don't know. I'm curious about your take. Is it possible that AI could be built that way? Language model first and then the grounding next? Or... You have a strong belief it should be first ground the basic vocabulary and then expand from there. Uh, yeah, th th this is uh, uh, this. I, I I don't have hard scientific evidence on this, so this is a question of uh, your one's uh, belief and judgment call. So I am of the grounding first school, but I'm willing to be proved wrong. So uh, I I I think of it this way. Uh, okay, let, let me so let me give a uh, sort of uh, slightly speculative evidence in favor of my my beliefs, which is that uh, 
many of the words in language have, have are evolved by as metaphors so there is we we talk about climbing the ladder of success you know right so we we talk we use uh, the the spatio temporal world the world of movement movement of objects movement of agents agents causing things uh, causing uh, something to happen to an object and so on that is very much something on which uh, the metaphors from that are very much central to language uh, i mean uh, george lakoff who's a linguist at berkeley i mean he's written uh, books on this topic uh, so sort i'm of emphasizing the importance of metaphor for uh, for language and he was doing this essentially to counter chomsky who had a much more formalistic grammar type approach that language and usage is built up with uh, with this laddering of a metaphor and uh, so in that sense that would essentially argue to me that it might be easier to build language that way uh and of course we can also we also know that we can build skills uh without language because uh, certainly uh, you know crows have intelligent behavior and uh, uh you know gorillas and chimpanzees have intelligent behavior so the building of motor skills right the ability to uh in uh, to open a, a a door handle right the ability to insert a peg into a hole the ability to thread a needle i mean these don't fundamentally they these don't require language so the development of that as a purely scientific matter should proceed without needing the 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 layering of language uh but but time will tell so i am betting my scientific uh, career on the on the the physical intelligence first followed by language uh but you know we we should we should all try our our favorite approaches and then uh, then we'll know what works that that definitely resonate with me but um i i willing to hedge my bets that <laughs> just like you that the other possibility is is certainly not not to be uh, ruled out at this point um one of the things you said in a recent talk chatendra is that the big challenges ahead of us or at least many of the big challenges ahead of us in artificial intelligence are essentially what a child learns acquires before age 5 can you say a bit more about that yes uh, certainly I, and and these are essentially challenges of of sensory motor coordination if you will so these are uh, the ability of a child to uh, uh manipulate objects to pick up objects to recognize objects to throw balls to uh, uh assemble lego pieces together uh all of these are are they, they're not easy and we think of them as easy because as adults we can do them easily but if you observe your child at the age of 2 and 3 you will find that they have to do an enormous amount of practice for this turns out that uh, uh that uh, i mean there is data on this because our colleagues in psychology are studying how children acquire these abilities and uh, for example uh, karen adolf at uh, nyu she has studied how children learn to walk and she did it in a way where she was trying to be as ecologically valid as possible observe children in a more natural setting and then it turns out that they just fall a lot they that's part of the the process of learning to walk they fall a lot it doesn't hurt them so much because their bodies are soft there's a lot of fat they are relatively short so the center of gravity is low so the fall is not too big and they somehow just get up and start trying again and she has these numbers on how many falls it is and it's it's quite a lot and similarly the attempt to try to manipulate objects so the children seem to be just trying to do various activities which are of interest to them and and acquire these these skills i almost think of the age this you, you mentioned the age 5 i think that age 5 is actually set by this because uh, you can't send a child to school to start to learn to write 
if they cannot hold a pencil and manipulate it. So fine motor control has to come to a certain threshold level of capability before you subject a child to the discipline of learning to write. So in fact, that five threshold that you pick is actually related to uh, the, to to the acquisition of certain uh, certain expertise. And of course, it's not just sensory motor. There is also social expertise. Children acquire the ability to they build, develop models of other agents, their caregivers, other children. They learn to they they figure out that they have goals. They have, they learn how to work with mutual attention. So there is a lot of sophisticated capabilities that have been acquired by age five. One thing here really resonates, especially to Tendra, you said the kids fall very often. It actually takes a long time to learn to learn things for them, right? And um, as you know, I, I became a dad not too long ago, and people will ask me, um, <laughs> you know, is it anything inspiring your research? And my main response has been, I think we're not giving our reinforcement learning agent enough rollouts. Um, because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because these tasks yeah. that seem simple to us, as you said, are actually take a long time to acquire, and we might just be too impatient in terms of how many rollouts we give to our agents to to acquire these foundational skills that then other things can be built on top of. Um, now your research has changed quite a bit as a cause, and I want to get to computer vision later because that's where you spend most of your time until very recently, but now you're spending a lot of time on robotics, robot learning. Um, wh what are you working on right now? What are you most excited about? The, the high-level problems that I'm most interested in are, is uh, what I would call a skill acquisition. And I'm using the term skill as some kind of sensory motor behavior. So what are, let me explain that with examples. So the ability to walk is a skill. The ability to crawl on four legs is a skill. The ability to twirl an object in your hand is a skill. The ability to throw through a ball is a skill. The ability to catch a ball is a skill. The ability to, uh, you know, slice an apple is a skill. So these are, and and so so what does a skill include? A skill includes sensory aspect. Uh, so the use of vision but also touch, also proprioception. Uh, all of these uh, are, are important for driving the, the act, action. And then there is some physical transformation that happens. An object state is changed or an object is sliced or what have you. So so to me, that's how I think, uh, I think of uh, as the central problem. And I think that skills... We have some atomic skills and then we combine them to produce more complex skills, skills and then ever more complex skills and so forth. And as grown-ups, we sort of have this repertoire with us. And, and, and therefore, now we can learn a fairly complex task. Like suppose, uh, I don't know, you, suppose you are hired by a company to become a, a washing machine repair person, right? You'll have to learn some specifics. But you start with a set of basic skills which all humans have. Or another example might be driving. As a, uh, like as a teenager, at 16, you learn to drive. Well, you learn to drive in like 10, 15, 20 hours of driving. But that's really, uh, that, that doesn't, that's concealing a lot of stuff because it builds on skills that you acquired between 0 to 16. So, Okay, so that's the that's the high level thing. I mean, that's what my research agenda is. I feel it's about how to acquire skills, and then obviously we can think of it as a meta problem, which is I want to acquire specific skills for robots, and then I want to have a methodology such that the next skill I acquire, I can do it more quickly and more efficiently. And in our group, the one we picked on first was uh, walking, and there was a reason for that. Uh, first of all, walking is a very uh, something which everyone can do. I mean, and walking on two legs, walking on four legs. I mean, both versions of the problem are interesting. I, uh, it's it, it's it's obviously common in uh, biology because it's connected to movement, and movement is important. And uh, uh, and it's a problem which has been uh, studied in robotics for uh, decades. I mean, uh, 
Boston Dynamics his videos are seen by millions of people. Uh, but they approach the problem in a more classical control uh, design sort of a way. So the challenge here was how do we approach it in a learning framework and uh, paying a lot of attention to sensory inputs. So I feel that when uh, we got into this uh, problem, those were the two angles that we were bringing in, which are not, shall we say, standard issue. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I sort of thought, okay, there has to be a, dev there's a developmental story for our human babies. So therefore there has to be a learning story, which uh, we should work for robotics. And then as a person who has spent most of his career in vision, I felt that sensing has to be there from get-go. Don't think of sensing as something which you just add later or you or you do it and then you you get some clean uh, state and then you throw it over the wall and you hope that it will work. Uh, it has to be part of the system design from the beginning. Uh, so that's how we got into walking and, uh, and uh, I, I was also lucky to have uh, very good students and collaborators. Uh, Ashish Kumar was my student, uh, Deepak Patek, who was at that time like a postdoc working with me at uh, Meta. Uh, and, uh, and we had a real fun time and we were uh, able to make a lot of progress. Yes, I made a ton of progress. Um, and, and I'd love at some point for you to maybe queue up some, some of, of the videos of the results because I think they, they kind of speak for themselves, but of course talk through them such that uh, people who are just listening and can also understand what's happening. You, together with your collaborators, develop this concept of rapid motor adaptation. What is it, rapid motor adaptation? And what is it enabling for these robots to do? Uh, so let me maybe first explain the term adaptation. So in, in machine learning, a central concept is generalization. So, uh, I mean, uh, we made progress in computer vision when we decided that to recognize all the chairs we were not going to be able to write down a mathematical definition of a chair, but we would have examples and then somehow the concept, we would give lots of example images and then the system would learn what's a concept of a chair. And that's generalization. I mean, there are many different kinds of chairs, but there, there's something common about all of them. Okay, so I'm the counterpart of that term generalization is uh, adaptation for me or any motor activity. So when you're walking, what you need to do is, you need to walk on flat ground, you need to walk on stairs, you need to walk in sand, you need to walk in sort of very uh, slushy, slushy mud just after the rains, in grass, on a hiking trail, et cetera, et cetera. So, and we are able to do that. If we had like a fixed, exactly a fixed program, it would not work so well. Right, you you the, the the you want to adapt to the terrain, right? So so therefore, hence the term adaptation. Uh, now, uh, this idea actually connects to something that people in classical control have known about from the fifties and sixties. I mean, they have this field called adaptive control, but it was in a in a slightly different framework where, by and large, the models were linear and they were assumed to be known and so on and what we are doing in the learning paradigm is uh, something akin to that uh, that goal but with uh, much more modern and flexible tools which uh, deep learning provides okay so so i've i've got to the adaptation part what we, which we need to achieve motor adaptation because it's the motor action walking is a motor action okay Rapid. Now, why rapid? Well, we need to be rapid because uh, the terrain can change very quickly from uh, un on, under our feet. And, uh, you know, if you walk and then there is something slippery in front of you, then you will start to slip. But we recover. So, I mean, the time scales are on the order of a second, right? Because, you know, in walking, a gait cycle is on the order of a second. And you, if you take a misstep, you stumble and you recover, that should take on that order as well. If it takes 10 seconds, it's no good. You'll, you'll be, you'll have fallen down and you could hurt yourself badly. 
and this sadly this this happens right i mean we uh, uh, old people falling is a is a is a major health uh, crisis really uh, so uh, so that's why our goal was rapid motor adaptation so adaptation on the skin uh, of like a second or less which is which enables you to recover without uh, severe fall or damage and now then it comes down to how do we achieve it and uh, for achieving it it's really about changing how you are walking so walking here means the commands you issue to the motors of the different joints in the different legs in a way that adapts to the terrain uh, sand hard ground slush and uh, what we developed was a technique for very rapidly inferring some aspects of this terrain and changing our behavior accordingly and this is what uh, uh, we call rapid motor adaptation or rma is the abbreviation for that and uh, it's based on a very simple idea the idea is that uh, if i i issue the same commands to my body how it actually reacts uh, will depend on the terrain so if i'm walking on a hard ground so let's say i'm 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 like blind i'm not looking i'm not thinking i'm being the absent minded professor i'm just walking on on i was walking on some hard ground and then i start and i walked on to the beach and now i'm in sand what will happen i will put my foot down and i will lift it up in the with the same force that i was doing a few seconds ago but in the sand my foot sinks in so when i lift it up it won't with the same force it won't come up to the same extent and this is being sensed by my proprioceptive system and it tells me that something is different here so how my body so we have a certain desired effect we issue a command but what actually happens is different depending on the terrain you are and this discrepancy is the signal that we can use to adapt and you just throw us a little bit of uh, learning bumbo jumbo on top of it and we can make it work i mean i i think the intuition is basically what i explained and then then there are a few technical details but i i think i've given you 80% of the of the idea right here one of the things that really stood out to me watching the videos and not sure if you're able to to pull any up chatandra is the I, ability i can do so but maybe just after this question yeah yeah the ability to to deal with slash adapt to such a wide variety of terrains it's just like experiment here experiment there terrain changes every time and somehow the robot has this completely different interaction because different friction different inertia of maybe objects is interacting with and somehow it just stabilizes itself and keeps going and i th- i think it's it's really surprising how capable it is um in my mind it's it's very reminiscent of uh some of the old boston dynamics videos in the sense that they were also very surprising how capable these robots were but the difference is that this is just done by learning not a whole year of engineering to get to the next terrain let's say or the next video that you can release. And so there's something magical here I think the fact that learning can achieve all this and I wonder what what it makes you think like given learning can effectively achieve as much as was done with engineering at Boston Dynamics and possibly more what do you extrapolate that to what is going to become possible next? I think that maybe at this point for the readers uh, who are who can watch the thing I would like to show some videos and then I'll answer your question. Sounds good. Okay. So I uh, just to talk over what's happening so we here we have our robot dog and it's in the rocky area next to a river bed on the Berkeley Merida and it's scrambling among these rocks and uh, it gets stuck but then it moves the foot over and manages to do that and here's an example where it's uh, uh, it's going down uh, some stairs on a hiking path and uh, the stairs are sort of concealed by a bunch of leaves but yet it manages to recover and not fall and here the robot is trying to walk on a loose mud pile at a construction site 
in all of these the 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 hold is is sort of unsteady but it uh, the foothold is a bit unsteady but it manages to make it through and here's an example of this is an indoor example with on some planks and my student ashish who was working on this this was in the era of the pandemic and uh, he had the robot at home and basically he used to go to sleep with the robot next to him and uh, these are experiments in his house where the robot is scrambling on a bunch of planks and uh, it it again this is a setting where humans would be quite unsteady in their foothold so these are all examples of how uh, uh, how uh, yeah, the kind of variability it can deal with so let me stop here and re return to your uh, your question so what is the the oh, future hold on hold on Hold on, Chetaner. Before you return to the question, I just want to emphasize that all the different cases you showed, it's the same neural network controlling the robot, right? The same neural exactly. network knows how to adapt to all of these scenarios. Exactly. Thank you for uh, making that clear. Yes, it's exactly the same policy in all the cases. It's not like, uh, you know, in the old style of computer programming, you have these if then else is, so if something do this, if something do something. No, here it's all the, exactly the same program. Now, what's happening underneath the hood is that uh, that in these different terrains, some estimate of this this external conditions is being estimated. We use the term latent, latent in extrinsics, and then uh, and then essentially that guides uh, the the robot's walking behavior to change appropriately. So, I I think Peter, before I started to show the videos, you were asking about. Uh, what does this mean or what is the implication of this style relative to the more classical uh, style which as represented by Boston Dynamics where you sit down and figure it out and write a control law. So uh, so here is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a little historical remark here. I think that if you look, look at the history of physics over time, if you look at physics in the 19th century, uh, there were no computers then. So what a clever physicist had to do to understand a phenomena was essentially to write down differential equations. So, you know, Newton, Maxwell, I mean, the nature of physics is was captured by these differential equations which described the phenomena. And that's the, that's the mindset which uh, came into control theory. You have a physical system, so you describe the dynamics by some differential equations. Now, uh, from a that now, what are the practical issues here? The practical issues here are all that they, these differential equations they might require knowing something about the mass, something about the friction, and so forth, right? So the the, the physics is correct, but the physics has all these unknown parameters, and these unknown parameters will actually keep changing as I'm walking on stairs, leaves, mud, sand. I mean, these parameters keep changing. So even though in theory, the physicists have a way of understanding this going back a couple of hundred years, the practical implementation, I'm stuck with the, the issue that I don't know all these, all these parameters. Then there is the complexity of, uh, of contact and making contact and breaking contact. So when you have uh, legs, then there are some legs on the ground, some legs above the ground and Every one of these regimes requires a, a different model. So all of this, when you try to do it in an analytical style, which is the, the old style, you write down the equations, you design a controller, you, you, you do it on pen and paper, and then you just uh, implement it on the computer. This style works well for simple systems, which, which are identified where we know these parameters. And, and, and this is great. See, this is... This is responsible for the successes of classical control. I mean, uh, you know, uh, man went on the moon. I mean, I think of the Apollo mission, and uh, you know, you needed to make sure that the the, uh, the that the orbit around the moon was accurate. And these kinds of capabilities were provided by by techniques derived from classical control theory. Now, in our current setup, what we have is this very complex system for which the model may not be written out in advance. And learning approaches, what they have the, the benefit 
is that they can deal with the with with these these unknowns as part of the the learning process so we are dealing with kind of identifying the the system at the same time as you're learning a control law and and this is very powerful and and uh, to return to my analogy of physics that classical physicists of the 19th century operated in a certain way but what do the physicists of 20th century do or post 1960 or 1950 do we have access to a computer so you don't have to rely on an analytic solution of a differential equation you can simulate the system right and you can simulate the system and you can simulate it very accurately without having to make simplifying approximations and and this is i mean in statistics same thing an earlier generation of statisticians had to make these simplifying assumptions that that n goes to infinity there's some distribution which is gaussian because that enabled you to make the math go through okay if you take samples on a, with a computer we don't have to make those uh, those uh, approximations so in my view uh, the 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 power of the computer and simulation of the computer is that we no longer have to make the kind of simul- simplifying assumptions which were needed to make the math go through for previous generations of physicists statisticians control engineers so simulation is is the answer in that sense now simulation of course relies on having that underlying physical model because there's no black magic here but simulation benefits from uh from moore's law we every year the computers get faster the technology for simulation gets a bit more accurate so if you are relying on simulation you're riding that curve whereas when i'm relying on writing down a, being very clever in my head i'm sort of relying on human ingenuity which doesn't change that rapidly so anyway that's some kind of a intuition for why uh, i think i i'm a, i i'm very bullish on simulation uh i not all colleagues in robotics agree uh and there's this old line or old joke which is that simulations are doomed to succeed uh with uh, but i think that uh, you have to use simulations artfully you have to know their limits you have to have the right technique for transferring from simulation to real but i believe that it has a major role to play in uh, advancing the state of the art in robotics i personally by the way agree that simulation will play a very big role at least for prototyping everything and hopefully even for learning things that can then be transferred zero shot or few shot in the real world the challenge i i tend to run into in my own work and with simulation i don't know what your take is i'm curious to tenor is that the simulators tend to have limited diversity compared to real world and so it's hard to have the same kind of maybe um general you know experience that the real world has somehow bring that into a simulator yeah that's a that's a valid point and uh, but but i view this as a matter of time because i i think of to me the ideal simulators it, it it's not like a one shot process i think it's a feedback loop so when we when we build a simulation we are building essentially a model of ex- the external world then we train a system in that we put it out into the real world and then something doesn't go right well that might tell us something to change in our simulation so this is itself a a cycle which i think of as it as more or less the scientific process because in a way i think of a simulator as a theory and the real world as an experiment and science is about a theory and experiment but it's not never one way it's a loop okay so that so so that diversity that you are seeking will emerge as we put more effort into this and uh, in certain settings we can do this by capturing reality so some part of my work and this was uh, a little bit at berkeley and a little bit with colleagues at meta has been about the simulation environments like we had one called gibson another one called habitat where what we did was we scanned real world apartments and then put them inside the computer and then use that to study navigation strategies for a mobile robot and it turns out that that way you get the the statistics of the real world in some way and uh, uh, so simulation 
rests on a variety of technologies, all of which are getting better in my view. Uh, so, uh, the because think of, uh, I mean, if you think of Hollywood movies, right, they have very good graphics, they have very good physical effects. So that surely tells us, at least they're good enough to fool us visually. So it tells us that maybe the prospects of this area are, 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 are good. Uh, it's, a, it's not, it, it doesn't work in all settings. I mean, there are uh, colleagues who believe really in uh, training in the real And I believe a little bit in that too. I mean, so I'm hedging my bets here. There are people in my group who do training in the real world and there are people in my group who do training in simulation. And I think the future is belongs to both. Talking about what's ahead, the robots you showed that, that you trained with rapid motor adaptation can navigate a wide range of terrains. Um, are there still terrains that they cannot handle? The, ro the examples I showed so far were for a blind robot, and this robot could not handle climbing stairs. It could handle climbing downstairs because you sort of just fall down and avoid falling. Climbing upstairs, it couldn't do. So for that, uh, we found it necessary to introduce uh, introduce the use of vision. And if you don't mind, I'll show you. Uh, can I show you some video on that? Yes, please. Okay. So this, what we are going to see now is a robot which walks and it has a camera. And on the right, you see what the camera sees. It's an RDBD camera. It has no advanced knowledge of the terrain. And it's trying to walk on a bunch of stools. So if it makes a mistake, it's going to just fall down in, and uh, uh, it's able to do that. Here is an example where it's trying to climb a bunch of stairs in the park and uh, it's sort of struggling, but uh, it manages quite effectively. And what's impressive here is that this is a relatively small robot dog. So the height of its legs is relatively small and the stairs are a fairly big uh, fraction compared to the height of the robot. Uh, and, uh, and and this is just a little observation, right? And people who have very small dogs in homes know this, that if a dog is very small, it has trouble with the stairs in the home. So here, the robot is struggling with this uh, slope, and it's about to fall, but it manages to retain its footholds. And then uh, uh, very soon, it manages to make it. These examples were meant to illustrate uh, where, where vision comes in. So when the terrain is really difficult, so if I have to cross a river, and to, I have to cross a river because the, and there are some stones in the middle of the river, then I can put a foot on one stone, the next stone, and so on, and I can cross. I would not want to do that blind, right? I can walk on the beach blind, but... Uh, so, uh, so, so we... Uh, that is... Uh, so our uh, robot dog has this behavior that most of the time it can walk blind, and this is uh, this is uh, like humans because blind humans can walk quite effectively. But where do blind humans have trouble? They have trouble with stairs, and what they do is they poke with their stick and get a sense of the height of the stair and so on and so forth. And generally, they feel more comfortable if they have assistance there. And what we show is that our robot dog with a use of a vision system can, in fact, uh, manage these uh, these kinds of examples. So I think uh, you asked me what what can we not do. I think quadrupedal locomotion is pretty close to solved, I would say. Bipedal locomotion is harder. So when you have two feet versus four feet, four feet are easier because balance is easier. Uh, so if you said to me, oh, uh, like, what can we do with two feet? I mean, we can make, we have done versions of our uh, of our model with uh, for bipedal robots with two legs, and they work, but somehow it doesn't seem like that problem is solved. And uh, what's interesting here is that there seem to be, seems to be a, a revival of uh, interest in humanoid robots these days. And for humanoid robots, we'll need uh, the ability to walk, and then, of course, if the robot is to be useful, the uh, the torso and the uh, the the arms and hands have to be able to lift weights and do stuff. And there are a number of companies in that space. And I regard uh, 
uh, developing uh, locomotion, bipedal locomotion, which means locomotion on two two legs, uh, is still uh, still not a uh, solved problem. I want to switch gears for a moment to Tendra. Um, you spend most of your career, and still today, I imagine some of your time in computer vision. And I'm curious, what do you think of the current state of affairs in computer vision? Where are we at? Is it just a matter of scaling up a bit more? And what should we even scale up? Is it enough to do the you know, unsupervised learning and then things will just emerge? What is your personal thinking and intuition on, on the state of the field? So there are uh, what I would call the classic problems of core vision. So uh, I, I had a slogan for this. I used to call them the three R's of vision, which uh, one R is recognition. So you have an image and you have to say, does this have a chair or a dog or a cat? Okay, I had uh, a reconstruction, which meant uh, going to 3D. So uh, recovering a 3D shape of an object or the spatial lay layout of the scene. And then the third R, which in order to make it three R's, I called it reorganization, but some people would call it segmentation or grouping, which is taking the collection of pixels and breaking them up into uh, individual objects, for example. Uh, so these are the pixels which belong to a chair, these are the pixels which belong to a human, and so on. So for on these problems, we have seen remarkable progress. So uh, uh, recognition, I, I think that there's a lot of work which came out of uh, Meta, my colleagues at Meta, and then there was preceding work over the decades that I, I don't want to, I don't have the time to get into, which shows that, you know, building building computer programs for recognizing cats and dogs and chairs, I mean, we can really do remarkably well here. And uh, we can do this with thousands of categories. The work in this area is really about scaling up. You know, it's just we can do quite well, and if you give me if you give me more data and more examples, more labeled examples, I can make it work. And of course, the practical settings of that remain. For example, think of uh, uh, somebody who works in uh, medical image analysis, and they want to diagnose uh, some uh, problem in someone's X-ray. Well, that will require we can use this methodology and just train some more. Uh, more uh, give some more examples and train a system. Uh, in terms of breaking up the image into objects, uh, that's again a problem I've worked on for many years. But recently, for example, you have a system which came out of Meta called uh, Segment Anything, and that uh, that uh, it was trained on millions or even a billion examples, and with that, that problem can be solved. Uh, the problem of 3D reconstruction, it's somewhat solved, but not fully solved, I would say. Uh, so the version which uh, has, which has uh, for which there are very good solutions are, if you have multiple views of one object, then this is what uh, used to be called uh, structure from motion or SLAM. And now the preferred technology is something called NERF, uh, neural radius fields, and that gives remarkable pictures. But I don't think the problem is solved at the level of what humans can do, which is even from a single image, we can solve it. So I regard the problem of recovering 3D from a single image as still, uh, I mean, there are large part. we have made progress, but large parts of it are not solved. But this is referring just to the core problems of vision qua vision. Vision doesn't exist for its own sake, right? Vision exists for something. And I think vision connects into two neighboring fields. One is robotics, which is vision for guiding action. And this is what I have chosen to pursue in the last five years. The other field to which vision connects is vision to cognition. And I can say for cognition, I would include language as a proxy. So models which deal with vision and language together. And these, and this area is very open. I think there's been substantial progress, but there's a lot more to do. And uh, so I'm by no means, uh, I, I, I've, I think I, I, my first vision paper was four decades ago. 40, 1983 is when I wrote my first computer vision paper. 
and vision has seen tremendous strides, but I don't think of it as salt. There are these areas like the interaction between vision and language, long range video understanding. I watch a movie and I want to understand what answer questions about the movie. And that will be a combination of language and visual reasoning. Obviously, the applications to robotics are real. Uh, how to manage with much less data. Humans somehow manage to train concepts with far fewer examples than we can in, uh, in, uh, in AI and machine learning. So there is there must be something there we, we are missing. So in my view, there is, there's still plenty to do in computer vision. One thing that also comes to my mind is this concept of adversarial examples in computer vision. Can you maybe expand on what they are? And, and what are your current thoughts on them? Yeah, so these are examples which have attracted a lot of sort of uh, popular attention that you have, let's say, an image of a, of a stop sign and then you, you modify, and, and th this is an image, so you have pixels and brightness values, and then you modify it a little bit, adding a, some imperceptible noise, if you will, but then you feed it to your computer program, your classifier, and it says this is a snake. Or something like that. And it's kind of remarkable. And uh, we can explain these fairly easily because what's happening is that in these neural networks, they are classifiers, so they have a decision boundary. And so what that imperceptible noise is doing is modifying the image in a certain direction such that it fools the classifier. It just goes over the other side of the decision boundary. But humans are not fooled by that, right? A human looking at that image is not fooled by that. And that, what that tells me is that the human process of interpreting an image is more sophisticated than just that, that, that simple classifier. And uh, so that's a worthwhile topic for us to study. Uh, my own, uh, I've not worked on this problem myself, but I'm going to just, give a few throwaway remarks here. Uh, I, I feel that the right uh, way to understand any image has both a bottom-up and a top-down component. So the top-down component is what we exercise when we dream. So when we are sleeping and we are dreaming, what's happening is concepts somewhere in our brain go and there is some triggering of neurons and they, in fact, activate the visual cortex. Almost similar to what it would be activated by actually seeing an image. So there is a top-down and a bottom-up component. The top-down component is sometimes connected to generative uh, uh, generative models. And there are many technical definitions here and uh, and uh, I don't uh, I don't can don't, I don't I'm not sure what version will work out, but I feel that that that's probably the way to solve these examples that uh, we need to have an understanding of any of any image in a, both a top-down and a bottom-up way. Interesting. Yeah, food for thought for uh, eh, some researchers who, who are listening in here. Um, one of the things you've done in computer vision to Tendra, in addition to many um, algorithmic insights and contributions, is you started to put emphasis on the importance of benchmarking now over two decades ago. How, how did you decide to start doing that? What, why, why did you do that? And obviously it's had a lot of impact. Um, how, how do you see that impact evolve as you started doing this? Okay. Uh, yeah, so this, uh, this takes me back to uh, about 2000 or something like that, and, uh, or even earlier. And uh, actually the context was a discussion at a conference. I was... Uh, I had a, I had a little debate at a panel with one of my colleagues uh, called Olivier Fosheras, who was uh, who was one of the the people who studied the geometry of computer vision, and he regarded uh, structure from motion SLAM as those are worthwhile, respectable problems because we have a clean mathematical formulation for them, but he regarded problems like segmentation and recognition as kind of uh, of sort of dubious quality, shall we say. And in particular, he said segmentation. Okay, everybody writes up, submits a paper, and then they'll have some images, and they'll say, these are the groups that my sister 
fight and then we have to accept it and we are happy. And, and this is not a way of doing science. And uh, he was very much in the French tradition where you need to have mathematical formalisms and so on. So I came back from that trip and I was determined to prove him wrong. And uh, and uh, so the way so the way to think about it was how do other sciences for which there are no precise mathematical models do this? So like psychology and so on, they do experiments with humans. So therefore, the natural thing here was let's think about experiments with humans. So we can show images to people, and we can have. Uh, people mark the boundaries of objects, and if humans are consistent in this, well, that means that we have a scientifically valid problem to work on. So this was one one big motivation. Another motivation, interestingly, was that I, I had a student at that time, David Martin, who was also who had previously worked in computer architecture, and he was a, he'd been a student of Dave Patterson, who was one of our computer architect, famous computer architects and Turing Award winners from Berkeley. And in the field of computer architecture, they believed a lot in benchmarking. And they, because when any, when any new hardware comes, you run the same pieces of code and you try to classify, get the number of flops. So these trends sort of came together in some way. And so we, what we did was we said, okay, let's get a set of images together and you know what, what I'm going to do, Peter? I'm going to show you those, what I did. Okay. Here is a stack of CDs. Okay. This is from 2000. This was a Corel. There's a, a, at that time, you couldn't get images on the web. There were not that many images on the web. The internet was still in its infancy. So we bought this collection of CDs. And in each of these CDs, okay, I mean, do people even recognize what these are? <laughs> I don't know. E each of these contains a certain number of images, but you can load them on the computer. And then and then what we could do is we could have undergrads come and mark the boundaries of objects and see consistency. And then we use that as a way of actually studying the statistics of natural images and to define for this task of finding boundaries of objects uh, what was human uh, truth, which even if it was not consistent, it was even if it was not hundred percent percent consistent, it was say ninety percent consistent, and then this became also became data for training uh, machine learning algorithms. So it did a number of things. It promoted the use of data, it promoted the benchmarking, and it promoted understanding the image as a the collection of images, what's the manifold of images, and so forth. So, and of course, I, I don't want to take the, you know, the only credit for this mode of thinking. And gradually, this mode of thinking became more and more common in computer vision. I give also a lot of credit to uh, Pietro Perona, who uh, was at Caltech and who was formerly my student at Berkeley. But Pietro led the collection, first collection of images from the web. Uh, which was like, there's a collection called Caltech 101, which was used for object recognition. And then uh, there was uh, Andrew Zissiman in uh, Britain who did this. And there was a Pascal program. Antonio Toralba uh, at MIT. Uh, Alyosha Efros, uh, who also pushed a lot of data, uh, the importance of data. Fifi Lee, who came in with uh, ImageNet. So sometime between 2000 and 2010, the paradigm changed. It used to be that publishing a paper with a data set would be really difficult. And by 2010, it became that, no, this is this is the way we make our field scientific. Now, of course, if you think about modern era AI, it's all driven by deep learning. And the big breakthrough in deep learning was an image recognition. Deep learning had been around for decades, maybe not under that name, but neural nets been around for decades. But image recognition breakthrough on the ImageNet challenge, a benchmark that kind of found its way from these early days of starting benchmarking in vision. And I hear you have, you know, you've been part of the story there, why Jeff and then and his students ran things on ImageNet. Can you say a bit more about that, Chitendra? Yes, that this is a fun story. So uh, this is somewhere around 2011 or something like that, 2011, 2012, in this era. 
I was sitting in my office in Berkeley campus and it, and the phone rang and I picked up the phone. Normally, you don't pick up phones these days because these are usually uh, some random spam caller. I picked up the phone and it was Jeff Hinton. And I know him from ages, from the 80s. I mean, we are both old timers in the field. And, and Jeff didn't start the conversation with asking about the weather. Jeff's first question is, Jitendra, why don't you like deep learning? <laughs> you know, he was very direct. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I need to be direct back. So I said, oh, because you haven't proved the point. You haven't made the case. So then he said, oh, but we have these results on M uh, MNIST and CIFAR. And this and that. I said, those are, you know, little baby data sets and uh, I'm not going to be convinced by them. So then, uh, I mean, uh, we need uh, something with the complexity of natural images and so on. So he said, oh, okay. So I said, okay. Uh, so I said, oh, uh, for example, we have this Pascal challenge for object detection. And if you get good results on that, uh, then that would be impressive. So he said, okay, let me think. He, then he hung up and he called me back the next day and he said, Pascal, I know you guys like Pascal, but I don't think it has enough images for the techniques that we have. On the other hand, ImageNet, which also has come in, that has a lot more images. And I feel that that's more promising. What do you think of that? So I said, yeah, I'd be impressed by ImageNet results. So he said, okay. I'm going to go back and I'll make a couple of students work on this problem. And if we have something to show, I'll call you. <laughs> well, as they say, the rest is history. So that was Alex Krzyzewski and Ilya Sutskever. And uh, of course, there's a hidden variable here, which is that GPUs had come on the scene and uh, they played a role in this. So this accomplishment, I mean, there, was, there were GPUs, there was data, there was deep learning, putting it all together, and then the results of this methodology were very uh, were much better than the classical computer vision technique. And these results were presented at ECCV in, uh, in a workshop in Florence. And I remember we were all there in the room, and there are times when you see history being made right there. And uh, Alex had presented his results, and then we had a little argument. Jan Lekun was in the room, I was in the room, Alyosha Efros was in the room. And we were arguing about, is this real? What does it mean? And, you know, and then history, of course, is very clear about what happened. Talk about history and where things are going. Where do you see AI go in the, in the near future? Where do you see maybe exciting applications that could emerge that um, could really be uh, uh, impact humanity in a great way? I, I think all across the place, right, obviously. But... Uh, uh, let me state some of my favorite ones. So I I think uh, uh, medicine, healthcare. I mean these are these are very important. Uh, I mean these are these are about uh, there are many. I mean and these will not be completely uh, transferred to AI, but sort of the use of a human and a machine together. For example, in diagnosing X-ray images, I'm picking an example which is closest to my own competence. I've worked on things like that before. Uh, and, and these can be very, uh, you know, a, a remarkable and democratizing. So think of uh, like some blood sample, which you can take a photo. Taking a photo is easy now, right? Cameras are ubiquitous. Everybody in, even in a less developed country, in a poor country, people have access to phones and cameras. And, uh, can can you use them in some way? So there was a project I knew about where, which was in India, where in these underserved hospitals, you take a photo of a kid who's just been born, and from that you can estimate the weight, you can estimate aspects of uh, it was the child stunted in growth and so on and so forth. And then, I mean, equally in America, where uh, you know eighteen percent of our GDP goes to health, so that's that's a big area. I think of. Uh, of uh, elder care. I mean, I have very old parents myself. Uh, I mean, uh, we know that uh, that now post-retirement people live long lives and then their lives, the quality of the lives would be improved considerably if they had assistance at home. I mean, not everybody will be able to afford to have attendance all the time. It's just not possible for the economy to support that. 
but robot assistants could play a major role. So I'm, I'm picking examples which are close to my interests of vision and robotics, but uh, of course there are ones all over the all over the place. And uh, I want to say one thing because uh, there is always uh, whenever there's a discussion of AI, there's a discussion of AI taking jobs and so on. And I don't, I I'm not worried about that personally. I mean, and, and the reason is that I think that uh, we have seen the effect of computerization over time, but it takes a lot of time for the systems to adapt. And when the process is gradual, it goes through a process where initially you have humans and machines working together. Then the, the first the machine is just assisting the human, then the human and machine uh, work together. Then there is some part which is completely outsourced to the machine. The human then starts to do something more creative and fun and so on. I mean, if you think about programming, once upon a time, people had to program in uh, in assembly language and machine uh, with instructions. I have programmed a machine in the 1970s by pushing certain buttons to, uh, you know, load the, <laughs> the to, to bootstrap the program. And then we get to higher level languages and even more so. And then, okay, now we we use, uh, you know, a, a GPT to help us with uh, uh, getting a lot of the standard verbiage of the code ready. So my when when is there when was ever there this mass unemployment of programmers? I don't think we have seen that even. I mean, we've just what the productivity has meant is that we could now apply these techniques across many more settings. It would not have been worthwhile to do it in 1950s, given the effort of programming. There were many many applications you would simply not have tried to computerize, but we are willing to. So. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm not a professional economist, but uh, as an AI researcher, I have to think about about the consequences of my work. And I tend to think that uh, that in it will all it will be in conjunction with humans and it's not something to worry about in that same way. I see a lot more upside than downside. Well, I'm not thinking about uh, humans. Um, when a new PhD student comes to you or a prospective PhD student uh, chats with you at a conference maybe, um, what kind of advice do you give them uh, if they want to embark on you know, their AI research career trajectory? I always believe that people need to have a portfolio of skills. There is something where they should be broad and some ways in which they should be narrow. And like a T, I mean, sometimes people call a T model, right? That that I I think uh, there are some technical skills you need to master, right? If you if you can't write a PyTorch model or TensorFlow model, mm -hmm. or, okay, you need to understand obviously the basic math of machine learning, basic coding abilities, and so on. So so there is a basic cool technical skills that are essential. Uh, but then there is a certain breadth of knowledge which I also uh, uh, appreciate and I always tell my students that try to think a bit outside the box. I mean, if you're doing computer vision, maybe also read the literature on perception, maybe read the literature on neuroscience, maybe uh, uh, talk to people in computer graphics, uh, you know, uh, even art, uh, you know. So, uh, so I think that uh, because our field connects to so many other disciplines, I mean, AI broadly does, I think people who are more broad-minded can contribute more uh, uh, over a longer scale of time. Uh, and I think it's very important, of course, to be very adaptable. I think that if you insist that, oh, here is a technique which I once learned and I, I was good at it and I could write 15 papers with it. And if you just stay with that, you are doomed to extinction. So being adaptable is is uh, is is useful not just for walking robots but also for for uh, researchers. I have in my career had to adapt many times, given up modes of thought which I regarded as as great and ones where I was really good at, and I spent you know years uh, studying differential geometry, and then it became irrelevant. Fine, you know you move on, you know. So, uh, and then 
above all, in any research uh, enterprise, I think uh, uh, passion is important. I mean, I think that uh, uh, the the best researchers, in my view, they they sort of love what they're doing, and you sort of have to feel that you want to to do something, and you love this, and you want to read up all about it and make something happen. And when I see that in a student, I I feel okay. This is great. Well, let's talk about your trajectory, Chitendra. Um, as I understand it, you grew up in India. Where in India did you grow up? So I grew up in a city called Jabalpur, which is in central India. And uh, so I finished high school there. And then I went to uh, IIT Kanpur, which is kind of in the north near Delhi. And I was an electrical engineering uh, major as an undergrad. And uh, yeah, that that's what I was... Uh, I was trained in classical electrical engineering, but uh, and this is uh, uh, we're talking about 1975 to 1980 is when I was an undergrad, and but near the at that time computers were still sort of uh, you know not so common, and I I I got excited by reading about uh, computers and I took a few classes, but uh, at that time I I got into thinking about AI because I I just read articles in Scientific American and I thought, wow, I mean, this is a grand goal. Uh, and then I applied to graduate school and I got into Stanford by some, you know, fluke. Uh, I was very surprised that they admitted me, but anyway. I, so I, I came to Stanford and while I started out in sort of uh, a more, uh, you know, programming languages and architecture and that kind of stuff, very, within a quarter I'd switched to AI. And uh, in fact, I switched to working with uh, the person who coined the term AI, uh, John McCarthy. So he was my advisor, and uh, and and uh, I, uh, I I read the literature of classical AI, which was very much uh, Stanford was very much the center of logic based AI, and uh, John McCarthy was the god of that. I mean, McCarthy had coined the term artificial intelligence, and his view was that the way we are going to uh, solve the intelligence problem is that we are going to represent facts about the world using first order logic and then we'll do logical inference and uh, you could convert planning to be an inference problem you could uh, conclude deducing new facts about the world as an inference problem and so on and and that's what he believed in now there was a little niggling problem at that time which John McCarthy recognized which was that in common sense reasoning, you have this problem that uh, you give new facts and then your belief in old facts changes. So so the classic example is Tweety is a bird. Can Tweety fly? Your answer is yes, it can fly. But then if somebody tells you, but Tweety is a penguin, then you say, oh, okay, maybe it can't fly. And then maybe somebody tells you Tweety is a mechanical penguin with uh, motor and wings, then maybe it can fly. But then somebody tells you, what if the motor is broken down? And so on. So humans have this ability in common sense reasoning to change our assertions. Now, uh, this is not a problem for probabilistic reasoning, right? Did Bayesian reasoning with any new evidence, you change your beliefs. But in classical logic, this is a problem. But McCarthy wanted a solution to this problem in classical logic. And this is the problem he assigned me to work on. And it is a very hard problem and nobody can, I haven't solved, I didn't solve it. Nobody has solved it. And after a few years, I was just getting very frustrated. And then I met Rod Brooks. And uh, he was, uh, uh, somehow, uh, you, you, uh, Rod, this is Rodney Brooks, who's a well-known roboticist. And he was also a student at Stanford. And then somehow over a beer, he told me that all this logic stuff is nonsense. What you really should work on is his vision or robotics. And he actually told me about Moravec's paradox. And this is uh, at like 2 a.m., uh, 1 a.m. at this pub near Stanford. And I was like, I mean, it, 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 it really shook me because I had believed that all the important stuff was all this logic and reasoning and, and all of that. And here was somebody saying, no, what matters is what a cat can do. But I was con I got convinced, and basically within a few mo uh, months, uh, pretty soon after that, I abandoned my thesis with John McCarthy. I switched to working in computer vision with Tom Minford. So essentially, I abandoned 
my PhD two and a half years in. But it was the best decision or one of the best decisions I made. I think marrying my wife was probably my best decision, but this is close. Now that's amazing, right? Two and a half years in, making a switch in what you're doing for your PhD, I think it's it's probably very rare. I don't think too many people do it. I think a lot of people say, what if I just work another year and a half and I'll just wrap it up and you know, call it done? But you were, in some sense, in your early words, maybe too passionate about wanting to do something really meaningful in AI that you were willing to say, well, I'll take the sunken cost. <laughs> I'll take it and I'll just restart. It's amazing. Now, from Stanford, you came to Berkeley, as I understand. Yeah. Um, so one of the first, I think, AI professors at Berkeley, or at least modern AI professors at Berkeley at the time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so at that time, there was, uh, uh, I mean, there was Shankar Shastri, who had, was a control theorist who had switched to trying to do robotics. So he was a colleague. And then uh, there was uh, Robert Wilensky and Rothfi Zade, who represented certain schools of classical AI. Uh, but then I was the young kid who was hired. And uh, then uh, next year, Stuart Russell was hired. And the following year, John Canney was hired. And the Ron Fearing was hired. And that was the beginnings of AI and robotics at Berkeley. It was fun oh. because we are all uh, sort of young assistant professors trying to uh, create a field in a department which didn't really have much activity in this area before. Now, quite quite a cohort and obviously quite, quite a successful AI presence you, you built out at Berkeley. Fast forwarding many years, um, you have you know, graduated over 70 PhD students, postdocs to all the top universities, to the top industry research labs. And a li lighter thing is what I want to touch upon. You've also taken on a position in industry. How do you see the synergy between, or maybe complementarity between industry and academic research for AI specifically? Yes, uh, this is a serious question because uh, I at the last CVPR, we had a panel discussion where there were some academic colleagues who were worried that is academic research losing its relevance? And the concern came from, you know, a model like GPT-3 or GPT-4. It's really not possible to train such a model in an academic lab. And uh, I view uh, academia and industry as not in conflict, but complementary to each other. And here are some of the ways. Okay, so the most obvious one is in academia, we take very raw talent, right? A beginning PhD student. Over five years, we make them into somebody who uh, who's, knows a lot, who's had the confidence of building something and, and can go out and, you know, do great things. So industry cannot survive without the people that academia trains. Then the kind of research that can happen in, uh, in industry, uh, there are a variety of moods of that research. And uh, since I spent I spent some time with at Google, and then I've spent time at Meta. Uh, well, I, I, at that time it was called Facebook, uh, Facebook AI Research Fair. And uh, so there are different modes of industrial research, and maybe I'll just speak to that. So there's a mode of academic uh, of research in industry, which is just like academia, which is uh, individual investigators, maybe two, three people working together. Uh, the they have some idea, they implement something, they do some experiments, write a paper. But then you also have the possibility of these bigger teams, right? And and this is a mode which, for example, DeepMind has had and OpenAI has had, where you have a large team of people who work towards one, one project and you put a lot of, uh, what's the phrase, a, a lot of wood behind that arrow. And you have a critical mass and now you can build something much bigger. And... In my view, both modes are important. So I like to think of it as uh, small science and big science. And if you think of this, uh, there's an analogy to physics. And some of you may have seen, some of the people may have seen the movie Oppenheimer. So in Oppenheimer, uh, a very prominent character is, uh, is Lawrence, Ernest Lawrence, who was a physics professor at Berkeley. And he built the cyclotron. And he started this tradition of big science. Because before that, before if you look at 
physics papers before 1930, you never have papers with multiple authors. I mean, maybe one, maybe two. And now you have, now today you have these papers in high energy physics with a thousand authors. And really it started with Lawrence at uh, Berkeley because to build this equipment and then now you could accelerate particles fast enough and then that led to discoveries. But people had to get together. They could no longer hope to work one person by themselves. So I think the same is true for our field. We need to acknowledge that our field has both a AI as a small science component and a big science component. And both need to be pursued. It's not either or. Small science can do exploration a bit more readily. Big science can do exploitation more readily. Uh, given the current structure of the field, there will be more small science in universities and big science in companies. But it's not necessary. See, if you look at physics, when they do work on the Large Hadron Collider, it's all academic research. But it is big science. So a bunch of universities create a consortium. So uh, anyway, that's my my uh, my belief. I'm not. I think that it's complementary, and I value both small science and big science. And uh, just focusing on one or the other will be a mistake. You talk about passion for research, and I will say, I, I feel like I've, I've never um, encountered you not being passionate and, and pretty busy getting research done or or teaching for that matter. But do you ever take time off, and what do you do to relax? I like to uh, I like walking. So sometimes just going on a walk. I like I like going to museums. So I like traveling. So I don't often have time for that, but I like going to museums in Rome and London and Paris and things like that. I like uh, I like uh, reading. I uh, reading about lots of things. Some I think these are probably my 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 biggest uh, outside activities. Uh, you know. Walking, hiking, uh, traveling, reading. When you read, good at any sports, unfortunately. So, <laughs> so that's. Uh, yeah. I, I wish I was. Yeah, well, not at music. I can listen to music, but I cannot create it. If you'd been good at a uh, sport, maybe you wouldn't have been here now. So to to do AI research, so it might have <laughs> been a blessing. Um, when you're reading. Uh, are you reading fiction? Are you reading scientific books in other disciplines? What What are you reading? I'm I'm pretty uh, omnivorous. I read everything. I've uh, uh, I re I've read a lot of like uh, fiction, like uh, I don't know uh, mystery novels, uh, Sherlock Holmes. I can quote lines from Sherlock Holmes readily. Okay, I uh, uh, so I I I like reading uh, history a lot. I find history a lot of fun, and I like scientific history as well. And I let me give a, a re, a, an argument for that. And by I try to in, encourage students also to read the history. See, because history gives us, uh, you know, there there are many aspects of life where you never have exactly the same situation repeat. Right? History is that, but you can find nearest neighbors, right? So you can find, if you are in a situation, you can think, okay, here was a similar situation faced at this point in time. And uh, and this is true in the course of human history, you know, when we talk about kingdoms and empires and wars and revolutions. And we can talk about it also in the history of science. That, uh, And sometimes we, we now are looking at a field like physics and we think of it as so beautiful and mature. But Physics wasn't like that 300 years ago, or biology. It wasn't like that 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And things were very uncertain, and there were these debates, and there were absolutely wrong ideas and so on. And when I look at that, it gives me some inspiration and confidence about AI. I think AI today is like on everybody's tongue. We see it in the newspapers. But when I started in the field, which was in the 80s, it was like this little discipline which was kind of uh, tolerated in a computer science department because, uh, I mean, mostly they thought that this was just talk and it was never going to be real. But, uh, so how do you have the confidence to persist in a field when it, it's really not able to deliver yet? I think by historical analogy, by saying, oh, these other fields were also sort of uh, you know, 
uh, kind of very embryonic and they didn't work. And uh, I think when I try to project the future of AI, I do the same. I think we sometimes we worry about oh oh we 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 maybe extrapolate very quickly. We think oh suddenly this will happen, or sometimes we are. Uh, I mean, there's this old line that in the short term we always overestimate how quickly things will get done, and in the long term we we don't because there'll be there'll be discoveries which come out from somewhere which we have never not even dreamt of. So that historical perspective. Uh, Actually, grounds my even my 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 research. I, I I get some inspiration from that. Besides, history is fun. It's like lots of cool stories, but they actually happened. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing I really enjoy reading is is maybe you. Would, I don't know if you'd call it history, but it's biographies. Yeah, that is history. I I, I put that in the same category. Well, Jitendra, thanks so much for making the time. Really enjoyed this conversation. Likewise. No, this was wonderful, uh, Peter. Thanks for taking the time. And it was, uh, I, I enjoyed myself immensely.